Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Michael B. Moore, the Democrat running to unseat Congresswoman Nancy Mace. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Great to be here. Before we dive into your politics, let's just start. Who are you and why are you running for Congress? Well, um, I'm a, I've got a business background. I've led companies and organizations, and um, but my family roots in the low country here in South Carolina go back to the late 1700s. And I am descended from a number of people who have rolled up their sleeves and really tried to make a difference via elected office. And so um, if I'm elected, I will be the fourth in the last five generations of people to serve going back to 1868 when my great-great-grandfather, uh, Robert Smalls, was first elected to the South Carolina legislature, and then he went on to serve five terms in Congress. And as a matter of fact, I am running to serve in the same seat that uh, he would be running, he would be serving in now if he was in office. Can you talk about that history? How does it feel just generations later to potentially win the same seat that your family's held? Talk about those family ties a bit. Yeah, it's really, it's really powerful. It's, it's important. Um, you know, I've grown up knowing about my great, great grandfather. He was a Civil War hero. He was an enslaved person, commandeered a Confederate boat, sailed it to freedom. First African American to command a United States naval vessel. Uh, I, as I mentioned, was elected to uh, lo the South Carolina legislature first when he was there. He wrote the legislation to create the first free compulsory statewide public school system in America here from South Carolina. Um, did a number of things, served in Congress uh, for five terms. So growing up with, with him and then my great grandfather who was a lawyer and was in the South Carolina legislature, my grandfather, I have a cousin, uh, Judge Harold Boulware, who was on the team with Thurgood Marshall when they won Brown versus Board in 1954. So there is just this deep legacy around me. And, uh, you know, I just feel honored. I feel honored to be able to, uh, to, to try to serve in this way. And, um, and I'm inspired to serve because, you know, I've got four sons, I've got a two month old granddaughter. And I just feel like the world is, is much more complicated for them than it was for me uh, coming into adulthood. And so I, I want to try to make a difference. Let's talk about those complications. I was talking to a Republican just yesterday, and he said we are facing generational problems, generational issues that he hasn't seen the likes of before. So when you're running, what are those top issues that matter to you? Yeah, well, our campaign, we're focusing on, you know, kind of core kitchen table issues. Uh, you know, I'm a business person, so I talk a lot about the economy, making sure that more people can access better paying jobs to allow them to take care of their families. Um, I talk a lot about healthcare. Healthcare is the number one cause of bankruptcy in America. Uh, I've seen varying numbers, but up to 110 million Americans mired down in healthcare debt. I think we can manage healthcare differently and, and make that uh, more affordable for people. Um, the environment for us, we're a coastal district. I, I've seen reports that said that by 2100, uh, millions of people are going to need to be displaced from the coastlines because of sea level rise. We got to get serious uh, about sea level rise. Um, so there, there are a lot of really uh, key issues, and even thinking about you know the, the the notion of democracy itself. I think that's something that we have to be mindful about. I was on the steps of the Supreme Court a couple of days ago talking about voting rights, talking about our democratic institutions, and um, and I think you know we we can't take that for granted either. I do want to get uh, to your trip to Washington in just a moment. But before I do, I do want to dive a little deeper into these kitchen table issues. I've had yeah. the opportunity to travel across the country talking to voters in Iowa. I'm originally from Pennsylvania and the economy continues to be a top issue. People talking about the price of gas, people talking about rising prices at the grocery store, those types of thing. You were in the private sector for almost 40 years. You're a businessman. What do you think is needed to spur entrepreneurship today? Well, I mean, I think there's all kinds of things um, that we can do to create incentives for small and mid-sized companies to develop. I, you know, 
I am a bit concerned about the fact that I think I heard uh, recently that our federal subsidy to the oil and gas industry is about $20 billion. And in some ways, I mean, and I understand how important that industry is, but, um, you know, if we could take just a, you know, let's take half of that and invest it in small businesses, creating, you know, pools of, of capital for small businesses to, you know, to start companies or to, uh, to, to grow. I mean, I think, I think we just need to think more in a more balanced way about our small and mid-sized companies versus our large corporate companies, which get so much of our federal attention. The vast majority of jobs are actually in these smaller and mid-sized companies. And so I just think it, I think to start with, I think, you know, we just need to allocate uh, incentives and resources to support uh, those kinds of companies in a, in a much more intentional kind of a way. Let's talk about your district now. You were in Washington just a few days ago um, as the Supreme Court heard oral arguments to decide if your district was racially gerrymandered. So can you tell us a little bit about the case and your experience there? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's it's fairly simple. Federal courts ruled that 30,000 African-American voters were unconstitutionally gerrymandered from the first congressional district here in South Carolina. Um, with that gerrymander, uh, the Republican, my, my opponent, Nancy Mace, the, before the gerrymander, she just eked out a victory over Joe Cunningham. With that gerrymander, you know, she had a fairly comfortable, uh, comfortable victory. And so, you know, when I think about it, I, I actually engage with this issue less as a candidate and more. I mean, I, I am a citizen of this district. I'm an African-American citizen. Um, in a district where 30,000 African-American voters have been sort of exiled. So, you know, I engage with this, uh, you know, sort of personally, but also from a historical standpoint, my great, great grandfather uh, was in Congress in the 1880s. In 1884, he was gerrymandered from one district to the other. So it, it, it just strikes me, um, you know, I was, was in Washington standing on the steps of the Supreme Court and it just struck me that, wow, you know, it's, it's, it's a light year away from 1884, certainly. But here we are fighting for the same kinds of things that my great great grandfather had to fight for nearly 150 years ago. So, um, you know, the oral arguments began this week. And, you know, I, we've developed a plan to win that is not contingent upon what the Supreme Court does, but certainly I think fairness. And, uh, and when we think about principles like one person, one vote and, and kind of maintaining, uh, you know, sort of political agency for all of us that are in the, in the community down here, I mean, I think doing the right thing and, um, and returning some of those votes, if not all of those votes back to the district is, is the right thing to do. Let's talk about your plan to win a bit. This district, as you know, was largely red since the 80s, with only Joe Cunningham flipping the seat back in 2018. Nancy Mace, who's a Republican, won it in 2020. So what's your pathway to victory here in a district that has a recent history of being Republican? Yeah, well, first of all, I hear every day from people who are just really frustrated by, by Washington, by the, the tenor and the way that sort of politics is is sort of done these days, people really reject a lot of the divisiveness and uh, the hyper-partisan aspect of things. Um, and I also hear people say that, you know, my opponent, Nancy Mace, is much more interested in being on national TV and sort of grabbing headlines than in actually being here in the district fighting for, uh, you know, for the, for the citizens and the people here. So, um, look, I think there's, an enormous opportunity not only to talk to disaffected uh, Republicans and independents, but there are a couple of other um, sort of basic uh, tactics that I think we are going to exercise that we believe will lead us uh, to win. One is last time there were 30,000 uh, loyal Democrats who had not voted for Republicans in the past, but who just didn't show up to the polls. Well, we're going to go out and inspire those voters in, in really meaningful kinds of ways, and we're gonna get them to the polls. Beyond that, there is a large number of, uh, an inordinate amount of persuadable voters, uh, people who are undecided, people who kind of change 
based upon you know sort of interacting with the the, the issues and and the candidate and you know we're gonna invest in a good old-fashioned retail grass you know grassroots field organization where we are out with an army of volunteers knocking on doors having conversations meaningful conversations with people on their front porches registering new voters and and really inspiring people listening to them hearing what their concerns are and then getting them out to vote we think that that you know in a in a district where there are so many people who are undecided actually creating that person-to-person -person kind of interaction, touching them uh, is going to make an enormous difference. I want to talk exactly how you plan on inspiring people because right now with the dysfunction in Congress, which we will get to in a moment, too many issues facing Americans as well as a potential rematch of 2020, people are not really feeling inspired. According to a recent research, uh, Pew Research Center study, 63% of Americans have not much or no confidence at all in the future of our politics. So how do you fix that? How do you inspire these voters to not only come out, but come out for you? It's a great question. I, I think, you know, I am uh, someone, again, who is descended from a number of people who have served. When I talk about the legacy of people in my family, I think people, uh, what I hear from people is that that gives them a sense of, of trust about my motivations, about why I'm doing this. I'm leaning into legacy. I am trying to serve in ways that my, uh, my ancestors did. Um, and then I think just you know, I bring a business orientation. I, I, I reject a lot of the hyper-partisan divisiveness. I reject getting blogged down in the, the culture wars. I want to get things done and, and get things done today for uh, people in the district. So I'm focusing on these core kitchen table issues that we talked about. I'm focusing on the economy, on health care. I'm focused on education. 90% of our kids go to public schools. We've got to you know, deliver consistently high performing education, I'm focused on, you know, just a lot of the issues that really matter to people. And I think people are increasingly starting to realize that a lot of the stuff that's going on in Washington is really designed to uh, be a cog in the in the wheel to, to prevent progress from being uh, being enacted from from going forward. And, and I'm focused on trying to get these things done. One of those cogs in the wheel, as you said, Many people could point to the speaker fight of the past week and a half. Uh, your uh, challenger, Nancy Mace, voted to uh, motion to vacate Kevin McCarthy. Would you have um, moved to remove Kevin McCarthy as well? Is that something you both could have agreed on? No, I mean, I, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat. I, I'll let the Republicans deal with you know with their speaker but i will say on that i mean you know talking about all that's going on in washington there are very very few things that both democrats and republicans agree on in washington but the one thing they agree on is that nancy mace is is extreme she's too extreme and i think you know voting the way that she did and then showing up gloating with matt gates on steve bannon's podcast the next day i think underscores the fact that you know she is about the headlines she is about and coming on with the scarlet letter the next day you know she's trying to raise money or do whatever she's trying to do none of that has to do with the concerns of the people in the first congressional district and that's where my focal point is and that's where i've been focused going back to the 1700s when my ancestors got here I know all Democrats uh, supported the oust of Kevin McCarthy, but I do want to read part of an op-ed from former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. He also blamed Democrats for uh, McCarthy's ouster. He wrote this in the Washington Post. I disagree with McCarthy on virtually every issue, but in some critical moments this year, he showed that he was willing to stand up to his party's right-wing extremists and take the heat. Jeffrey should have been willing to take the same risk by rising above partisanship to save McCarthy's job, if not for the good of the country than for the good of the Democratic Party. Do you agree? Do you think Democrats there should have put country over party here and supported Kevin McCarthy or let the Republicans do their own thing? Because right now, the government is, there's a government shutdown looming, there's a war in Israel, and Congress has been described as rudderless. Well, look, I think Hakeem Jeffries would have been a far superior uh, speaker to start with, and that's where my vote would have gone, um, you know, back uh, when this last speaker was, was put in office. So it, it's not, it, it is, it, it's inappropriate to try to shift the blame on Kevin McCarthy's 
uh, exit to Democrats when it, it is about infighting in the Republican Party that brought about his ouster. So um, I, I think, again, Hakeem Jeffries would have been where my vote would have gone. Do you, do you think uh, Hakeem Jeffries was wrong then in telling Democrats not to vote for McCarthy? No, I mean, again, it, it, the, the Democrats are in the minority. The Republicans were driving that process and that vote. And so let them let them do that. I, I think that would have been my approach. Let's talk about some areas you can see yourself working across the aisle. Where are some areas you could work with Republicans? Because as you said, people are sick of these hyper-partisan times. Yeah, I, I can personally, I can work with anyone uh, who is coming to the table with, you know, sort of a spirit of, of collaboration and wanting to move forward. I mean, my whole orientation is to work with whomever um, to get things done. So much of the divisiveness now is really just an obstacle to getting anything done. And so, uh, you know, I, I believe in issues deeply, but I want to get things done for the people of South Carolina, for the people of the first district. And so I, I will reach across the aisle and work with anyone who is coming in good faith and wants to create progress on an issue. And what's next for the Michael B. Moore campaign? We are working hard. We are uh, continuing to get our message out here in the 1st Congressional District. We are uh, out uh, raising money, as you won't be surprised, and trying to you know, continue to, to touch folks. So our, our campaign, we jumped into the race relatively early because we knew it was going to take a lot of money and a lot of work and effort to uh, unseat Nancy Mace. We've got a great team. A bunch of people are coming together who have had senior roles and other high profile campaigns around the country. Uh, we've been out raising money. The first quarter of our campaign, we raised more money than any other non-incumbent in the history of the district at that stage of the campaign. And we're continuing to build on that success. And again, people are resonating with our approach. Again, I'm a kind of no nonsense business person. I have this low country kind of orientation um, and people, you know, are, are, are are resonating with that and um, and supporting us. Nancy Mace, over the past few years, has really become a national figure. You're seeing her on all the major news networks. So can you, in a sentence or two, compare and contrast yourself to her since you're running against her? I mean, I think the, the, the easiest contrast is that my interest in serving is with the people of the first congressional district. I'm not sure exactly whether she's running to be a vice presidential nominee or or just running to be on you know national TV headlines. Um, but I, I am really interested in moving the needle for the people here. I, it may sound a little bit corny. My grandmother told me once that whenever you leave a place, make sure it's better than when you got there. And, uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, the, the low country. And then look, I think on the issues, I think we are just uh, better for the vast majority of people when, you know, if you are gonna need to access, get a job and take care of your families, you know, we are gonna be supporting policies that will help people get better jobs and help create a more inclusive economy. If you at some point in your life feel like you're gonna need to access the healthcare system, we're gonna be fighting to get uh, more affordable uh, drugs and, 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 and medical care um, to ensure that, you know, m most people in this country right now are either an injury or an illness away from both medical and financial catastrophe. And we think we can fix that. Um, if you think at some point that public schools are going to be uh, in your family's future, like 90% of the other children, we're going to be better about supporting public schools and ensuring that each child has their best opportunity to move forward. If you're a woman and believe at some point that women's reproductive freedom is something that uh, is important, we're going to be out fighting not just around women's reproductive freedom, but our, I believe in the Equal Rights Amendment, I believe in pay equity, I believe in a much broader agenda to support women. Um, even gun safety, look, the number one cause of death among young people in this country right now is gun violence. That's, that's just astounding. Um, one can both respect the Second Amendment, but also agree with the rest, as, as do most Americans, in a 
sort of common sense approach to a number of issues to make our communities safer around guns. So there, there are a lot of things that, frankly, just on the issues, we are just better than Nancy and, and then Republicans. And, and I think people are starting to see that and understand that. Nancy Mace has broken away from the Republican Party a little bit on her views on abortion. Do you think there's anywhere that you do agree with her on? Because she did win re-election in your district. So her message is resonating with some people. Well, I think part of my responsibility and opportunity is to hold her accountable for the enormous gap between what she says and what she does. She does talk at times a more moderate uh, sort of tone around abortion, but she sponsored a six-week abortion ban, which is one of the more extreme pieces of legislation out there. She supported um, a piece of legislation that she derided as a a-hole bill, but that was uh, to prevent women in the military from accessing uh, you know, these important critical health kinds of uh, services. So you can't have it both ways. You can't talk a moderate game, but yet vote 90 plus percent with Marjorie Taylor Greene and the real extreme uh, wing of the party. So I think part of our responsibility and opportunity as a campaign is to, to start connecting the dots on that and helping people to understand who the real Nancy Mace is. Michael B. Moore, I appreciate your time. You're welcome back anytime. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity. It's been great.